And let's go through the, the papers now in a little bit more detail. Alex Petropoulos joins me to do that, political commentator with Young Voices UK. Alex, good morning. Good morning, Rosie. Uh, do you share the, the absolute fury that some of these papers do about the timing of the rail unions and their strike action? Well, in a way, yes. I think that you can't blame the unions for what they're done. They know what they're doing and they know the point of strikes is to disrupt. The real question are, are those strikes actually warranted and are they striking for a good reason? And in my opinion, the answer to that is no. If you sort of look at what they're in dispute over, it's over a pay rise that's been promised to train drivers that the unions have labeled inadequate. It's been for, they were offered 4% over two years, which is sub-inflation. But importantly, this is for trained drivers who are some of the highest paid within the whole rail industry. This is different to previous strikes we had where it was over rail support staff and that whole broader picture, many of whom were really suffering. And we've got to remember that 4% to an existing salary of 60,000, 70,000 pounds goes a lot further than a relatively higher percentage rise to a lower base salary. Mm. Uh, do you think that the public support for, for strikes, but when it comes to doctors and nurses, there is quite a lot of, of public support, but what about for, for the train, the train unions? People do view this differently, don't they? Yeah, the, if you look at sort of the, the rankings of what people care about, doctors, nurses, right up at the top, I think that people, the, the real question will be, does the public blame the unions and the train drivers themselves for the disruption? Or do they buy into the union's line and do they blame the current government and politicians who, I wonder who have do you blame? failed to cooperate? I blame the drivers, to be honest. Mm. In this specific case, I'm not in general anti-union. I think in, you really have to look at the specifics of each union dispute and each strike. And I think each one can be warranted on its merits. This one just doesn't seem to be in my, in well, my they, view. They've certainly lost the support of uh, some sections of the press, uh, definitely. On the front page of The Guardian, it is a really difficult reading. The warning here from the Inspector of Constabulary is saying the, the Met Police is, is not necessarily spotting serial killers and identifying murders because they're not properly investigating unexpected deaths. It is a another warning to how the Met Police is operating. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rosie, I'm, I come from a computer science background. And so when I look at this story, the big thing that pops out to me is data, right? Whenever you're trying to make conclusions, the most important starting step is having good, high-quality data. And the results of this report deal exactly the opposite of that. You see failing after failing. You see people, you see officers failing to even check pockets of people who've been murdered. You see officers failing to write down what gender the murder victim was, what race they were. When it comes to serial killings, patterns and being able to draw links between evidence you have are really, really important. It's pretty much the most data-driven crime. And yet at the same time, you have this coupled with what seems to be an institution that is institutionally failing to collect data, to train their officers properly, and apparently just giving haphazard and inconsistent advice on how to do that as well. Mm. Louisa Rolf, the assistant, an assistant commissioner for the Met, said the force was sincere in our desire to make real change to minimise the chance of a case like this ever happening again. Um, it, it is really challenging. In your, in your mind... How much sort of how much scope does the Met Police Force have to say, okay, we've made another mistake, but the public please get along alongside us? Well, you know, specifically within the report, it's sort of coming to the conclusion that at this point the Met can't help themselves. They really need somewhat like they need the adults to come in and sort them out, and they need the government to sort of come in and say, look, you just can't handle these things. We need we need you to step in shake things up, really just sort things out and create actual meaningful long-term reform. And that's what the public wants. And I think as soon as the public starts seeing that and can start believing that things are changing, the public will get on board. But as things stand, there's nothing for the public to look at and say, I can trust you. Mm. 
Let's move to the front page of the Times, why don't we? And uh, we were talking about it just very briefly there with uh, Terry Stiasny, but um, the BBC's chairman is going to probably have a a bit of a battle ahead of himself today as this investigation into his appointments uh, is going to be made public. Do you think it's tenable for Richard Sharp to stay, I know we haven't seen the investigation yet, but to stay in place since we do know that he was involved in facilitating that loan for Boris Johnson when he was Prime Minister? Well, you know, ultimately the decision will be up to him. I think that there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. And if I was in his position, I think I would stand down. You know, drawing parallels to the story we just had, this story is again about trust and trust in institutions. And, you know, people my generation don't have uh, a trust in mainstream media that can be taken for granted. You saw the BBC interview with Elon Musk a couple of weeks ago that was, to be generous, a train wreck. And a lot of people my age are the bar is quite low for them to sort of see institutions and see media organizations and treat them as trustworthy. And if the chairman of the BBC can't be seen as trustworthy, is that, that trickles a, a down to the whole institution. Sort of Twitter to, to how the BBC is being run. I mean, I, I think it would be. I think that I think that people my generation don't actually make that hard cut, clear distinction that you'd be making. I think the way that we consume media is largely through social media and is largely through shares and whatnot. And I think that if we can't see that the head of the BBC is being run by someone trustworthy, that makes a lot harder case for the BBC to sell itself. And, you know, personally, I do trust the BBC quite a lot, but I think it really does have a challenge ahead of itself in trying to sell itself to people my age and trying to sell itself as a trustworthy, respectable independent institution. And it's just makes that a lot harder to do. So from your perspective, this is really about optics. And so what they should do is get ahead of it and say, look, where we think there's something that doesn't look quite right, we just remove it. Optics as well. But, you know, if the BBC is going to be going ahead and saying, you know, we're a trustworthy institution, that requires change in leadership from the top. And from what I've seen so far, the chairman has acted in a way that would make me think that they don't have what it takes to do that. But like you said, optics is also playing a large part into that. This is about their relationship with the government of the day as well, isn't it? Uh, we'll, we'll get the details of that inquiry, we think, a little bit later on today. So something to be watching out for. Uh, talking about trust, uh, Dominic Raab, of course, is now uh, no longer Justice Secretary. Well, the new Justice Secretary is Alex Chalk. And uh, there's an interview he's done, and some of it's in The Telegraph, who says, I'll uphold Raab's very high standards and expects no let-up in tempo. Is that the appropriate language to use, considering why it was that Dominic Raab felt he had to resign? No, I think you're. I think you're right there. I definitely raised an eyebrow when I read that headline. I think that, yeah, there seems to be a, a lack of understanding um, over there as to the, the reasons that Raab got fired, and I think that there's this general approach with ministers and civil service of taking this sort of, I need to whip them into place, and I need to be this big sort of presence that's 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 creating productivity when in reality in my opinion i think that a lot of the time lack of productivity can come down to you know institutional patterns and come down to whether or not you've got good practices i mean this is this may sound like a small non-example but within the civil service civil servants have to pay for their own tea they have to pay for their own coffee they have to pay for their own biscuits that sounds small but little things like that can contribute to what is almost a hostile working environment and contribute to overall diminishments of productivity. If you're coming into maybe the role, productivity, you really but do you have... Maybe not yeah. hostility. No, it, not it might, it might breed maybe a bit hard. Yeah, it might breed sort of discontent, I guess, and, and, and frustration. Yeah. And we know that civil servants are walking out today. Um, actually, the head of the union is going to be on breakfast just after seven o'clock if you're interested in, in staying for that. But what this really is about is that the new man who's come in to replace Dominic Raab is saying things like there's going to be no let up in the tempo of work and high expectations I have of these talented public servants. I think it's about getting the balance right, isn't it? About saying, look, I've got high expectations and I want you to work really hard. But I, I also uh, need to do that in a, in a careful way, which means, you know, people's mental health are looked after definitely um, so yeah. that we can all work effectively and efficiently in a way that people are happy and healthy. A hundred percent. And, you know, I don't, I, I really do believe that he's coming to this role and he wants to make positive change and he wants to get the civil service functioning properly. 
And if he wants to do that, great. He should really look at, you know, tackling wide scale reforms and ensuring that, you know, like you said, you're creating a positive environment for people's mental health, for people's work life balance. You're creating, you, you're sort of looking at the problem from a top down position where you are coming in as the minister, as the secretary. You have so much power to do good. And yet, so far, all we've seen is you sort of projecting control. Mm-mm. We'll have to see how he gets on uh, in the role. Um, the coronation uh, just coming up uh, a week tomorrow. There's lots of stories in the papers, of course, royal stories sort of littering the papers throughout as as sort of momentum builds, I guess. But um, the, the king has picked out quite a diverse cast for his procession. We're getting more details of who's taking place. And front page uh, of the Telegraph here has uh, Baroness Benjamin, who's going to carry out part of the ceremonial regalia in the coronation procession. And she says her involvement sends a really clear message that diversity and inclusion is embraced by the king. Do you think King Charles III is someone who better represents all parts of the United Kingdom? Uh, I think so, yes. And I think you've got to go one step beyond that. And remember that Charles isn't just king of the United Kingdom. He's king of a lot of countries around the world. And, you know, his coronation should really reflect the nature of that and all the countries he represents. You know, we look back to the last coronation we had, and it was, I I don't even know how many years ago. Um, I'm not going to try and do maths on air. But you really have to, the the coronation should reflect modern times because we don't know when the next one will be. And, you know, like like I said, it's not just king of the United Kingdom, it's king of, well, many countries around the world, and we should reflect that. Mm. Uh, more details of that on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Um, just finally, uh, would you ever shop at HMV? <laughs> Personally, no, but I have many, many friends who would. And, you know, it's really starting to pick up in popularity. One big thing that a lot of my friends are concerned about, which may sound surprising, is in modern times, you can't really own music. With all the streaming, you never actually have a physical copy of the record, a physical copy of the song. And people really value original physical copies. They want to feel like what they have won't suddenly be taken away from them when a streaming service decides to change the terms of service. And records, cassettes, even CDs represent to people my age some sense of ownership which they've largely lost control of Mm. did you ever go to the store on oxford circus i've I've never been there i can't believe i used to love walking around in there just even just being in there and listening and sort of soaking up the atmosphere but i have to say walking down oxford circus now is a a pretty uh, miserable experience with so many of those uh, shops shut um alex it's Mm. been a real pleasure having you on the program thank you very much talking me through the papers this morning a political commentator with young voices uk and i'd be